All right. We are going to have Daniel. Daniel, you can come on up. We're going to kind of sit, and then we're going to tag team each other and go back and forth, do a little dance here. And so uh, this is Danielle. Oh, Don did it. This is Danielle Strasser. There you go. There you, go. you got some fans back there I can hear. All right. So um, a couple things is, you know, as we thought about this, you know, we, as we looked at, you know, well, you know, what we realized is that when we thought about Pentecost, we thought about it's kind of what we want in the service all the time. It's, it's not that different. We want Pentecost, the, the truce of Pentecost Sunday, in all of what we do and everywhere, every, everything that we do. And so, you know, I was thinking about this is, this is really, when you gather together, it, some of you are just, you know, completely connecting with all we do in a Sunday service. But there's sometimes, if you've been to a place that you've, if you've been to a place that you don't really know what's going on, <laughs> or you know, that, that feeling like you think, oh, what is, I don't know how to enter in here. You kind of feel a little bit on the outside. If you guys have this kind of, some kind of, like, whoa, what is this I'm in, and what do I do with this situation? I was trying to think of examples of this, and I thought about my dad, and he took me to an auction. Now, I was just a kid. I just thought we were going to get something, right? But we walk into this, this big room, an auction house, and I don't know, what, maybe this sounds bad, but people from auctions, they look different. They just like, they're just like a variety of people, quite different, and they were kind of like, they're kind of like uh, just so casual, hanging around and talking, and and uh, there's some pie, and I, I just like I thought this is just interesting. And then all of a sudden, this guy gets up, and and everybody pays attention, and then he starts talking about this item, you know. And then all of a sudden, he starts talking at this speed that I'm as a kid thinking, what's going on? He goes, oh, no, 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 no. I'm like, what is happening here, you know? And I'm starting to observe, and I'm, here's what I've noticed. And all of a sudden, these people are so relaxed, they're like all tense now. And my, my dad says, don't raise your hand. I said, what's that mean? I don't know what that means. Don't, 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 don't do that. Don't, don't jump around. And then everybody gets still, and they, da, 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 I had to figure out, okay, there's a guy over there. What's he doing? And I, I realized you can just, I thought, yeah. you just do this, and all of a sudden, something's happening. I just, you know, and I was like, where am I? I had no idea what to do. I was just like, this is, but I could feel the energy in the room, but I didn't really know what it all meant, right? It took me a while. And eventually, I started going to auctions, and I, hup, hup, no, don't, Debbie would say, don't raise your hand. That's usually what it was. I don't want that piece of junk. <laughs> so, you know, and sometimes I think with church, it can kind of feel the same way. You come into a church, and you think, why do we do what we do? Why are we really here? But it's kind of important for us to participate, to know what's going on. And so I just want to say, you know, for us, as we think about our Sunday service, we believe the Holy Spirit is active. We believe the Holy Spirit is indwells all who say yes to Jesus. And because of that, there's all kinds of things happening in this room. And that's just how we see that. And so if you notice how we go about our Sundays, because without the Holy Spirit, here's what we're lacking. Revelation, light, and showing things that we can't see, we can't be taught, we can't comfort each other, we can't get counsel, we can't encourage, we can't heal, we can't feel God's presence. We don't have power to do what God asks us to. We can't change our stuff that we want to change in our lives. We, without the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, that, that stuff doesn't happen. So we want to be a church that says, come Holy Spirit, and we welcome God to do that. And so if you, if you think about our service, like we are wanting that to happen, that you feel God even in interactions as you first come in. Because you can have God speak. We believe God is that we're a, we're a family, right? And he works through us. And so it, we always try to leave some time at the front and to find at time at the end to, to hang out and to, because we believe God works that way. And then when we start out, we take a few minutes and say, dial down, pay attention to what's going on, sell our hearts so we can hear maybe the Holy Spirit a bit better. 
And then when we're up here talking, you know, we, are, we realize we are, well, Daniel's one of the better talkers in the world, but for me, it's like, you can go online and find lots of talkers that talk better than us, right? But what's different about that here is that what we want is, as, I'm, as we're talking, we want the Holy Spirit to teach us things. And so we can see things and understand truths. And then we have worship. And what are we doing during worship? We're learning to open. We're not just wanting to have good songs that sing along and make us feel warm inside. We are wanting to actually use that environment to actually open our spirits wide open to the Holy Spirit. And that's why we, we have some pauses and we, that's why you see people raising their hands. Or, those are places of, of opening up for that. You know, whatever that means for you. Well, and then we get to the place of prayer ministry and what do we say when someone prays for you? What's our starting phrase? Come Holy Spirit. Usually what's happening? Then come Holy Spirit. <laughs> so as we, we pray, so we're asking what's going on, but we're not trying to counsel. We're trying to leave room for God to speak because he does the work. We don't, right? But we're a part of that process. And so that's what we are doing today as well, and that's what our hope is today. And uh, even like when you take a communion, it's about this place of, again, paying attention to what God's talking to us about in these deeper places and giving us space for that to take place to reflect on what Jesus did. All right. So we want that for the kids. We want that to be in gatherings we have that are small, in the parking lot, even with pancake breakfasts, with pancakes that have butter hats. We, I, I love that, that graphic. And so hang on. The Holy Spirit can move, stay around for, for pancakes, right? Right. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, today we're going to be talking about this place of, in the Kingdom Identity series, of being sealed with the Holy Spirit. And kind of today we're going to show how that ties into um, the identity series and how that takes place. And so I'm going to start with Danielle. And as I always talked about, how we talk about the... the uh, whole thing of Jesus being central in all that we do. I want you to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so the question um, that I was kind of noodling on as we were thinking about this morning um, that's really important to answer, I think, is why are we so obsessed with the Holy Spirit in this community? can be really weird if you're not familiar with the Holy Spirit, but even if you are, it's kind of like, why do they always bring him up? Why do, why is this a word that is always um, central to everything we do? And I think to answer that question, we have to look at what is central to what any Christian believes. Like, what is the central theology um, for those who follow Jesus? And that central theology is what is called the gospel or the good news of Jesus. Is it because I'm standing close to you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, they'll work it out, all right. Um, yeah, so it's the good news or the gospel. That is central to everyone who has given their life um, to Jesus. So what is the gospel? What are the basics of the gospel? We could talk about the gospel in volumes of books, and it has been, and you can also talk to, about the gospel in a sentence. I'm gonna try to find somewhere in the middle about what the basics of the gospel are. Okay, so Jesus, he is the son of God, and he is born of a virgin woman to be fully human and fully God at the same time. Jesus grows up into a man. He is baptized. He is tempted to reject God in all the kind of same ways humans are tempted to reject God, except he doesn't. He does not succumb to those temptations. And he begins, after being baptized and going through this temptation, he begins teaching about the kingdom of God, explaining what God's kingdom is in ways people had never really understood or heard before. And then he begins demonstrating the kingdom of God really in powerful ways, things that we call miracles, doing very dramatic things. And this caused two responses in people. There was a lot of people whose minds were blown and were like, our savior is here, this is amazing, this is the best thing that could ever happen. Our, our, all our hopes are coming true now that Jesus is here. And then another group, actually got really threatened and very angry 
about what was happening, about what Jesus was saying and doing. And that group began to plot Jesus' death. How to, kill with him, how to kill him was their best solution to what they saw happening. Now Jesus decides not to resist what they want to do to him, just kill him on a cross. And he goes to the cross willingly. And why does he do this? Why does he die willingly on the cross for us? Well, it's because he knows by doing this, he will create the pathway for the world to now no longer be separated from God. His death on the cross would literally tear apart the barrier that sin had created between us and God. His death would become the ultimate and forever atonement or payment for our sin. So his death on the cross creates for anyone who believes in him a state of forgiveness, or what we would call a state of righteousness. Not just, oh, I forgive you this one time. It's an actual constant state of forgiveness. Then three days after Jesus dies on the cross, he is raised from the dead. So now not only is sin defeated in the cross, by Jesus' resurrection, death is now defeated. And because death is defeated, we now know we have access to eternal life for anyone, again, who believes in Jesus will have eternal life. Now, often when we hear the gospel, this is kind of where it stops. And that's okay, because these are the things I think that humans, the two things humans most need, right, is victory over sin and victory over death. And this is central to the gospel and really, really important. But the good news is more than this. The good news goes beyond this. So after Jesus is resurrected, he walks around and hangs out with his disciples and his followers for about 40 days, and he continues to teach them, and he's trying to help it click for them what these two events mean for them right now and what it means for them in the future and what it means for the things that had been prophesied for hundreds of years before. So he spends this time doing that. And at the end of the 40 days, he ascends into heaven. Now, the ascension is a part of the good news because when Jesus ascends to the heaven, to the right hand of God the Father, he is fulfilling what had been promised, which was this forever king and a forever kingdom, one that would never change, you know, never change hands. It would be a king and a kingdom that would last forever. So when Jesus ascends into heaven, he is now above all rule. He's above all authority. He's above all names. Like there is nothing above him now. Everything is below Jesus. And that's true now in this age and the age to come. Some people call his ascension his coronation because it's in this moment that Jesus steps into being our divine king. And the good news now is not just for when we die. The good news is now for us in the present. But how? How is the good news now for us in the present and not just an afterlife situation? Well, Jesus, just before he ascends, reminds his disciples of this gift he'd been promising, that when he would leave, he would send a gift that would be better than him staying. And when this gift arrives, it's about 10 days after he ascends, and it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the day the gift of the Holy Spirit arrives is the day we call Pentecost, which is what we're celebrating today at the church is the arrival of this gift. And this gift of the Holy Spirit is better than Jesus staying because now not only is God with us out here, the Holy Spirit indwells those who believe. So the Holy Spirit is now here. God, Jesus, is here inside, not just outside of me. And that is part of the good news, Jesus dwelling in me, not just Jesus defeating death and Jesus defeating sin, Jesus doing those things to be with me in a way that would have never been possible before. Now that gift, that gift of the Holy Spirit sometimes gets tagged on as kind of like the extra resource to the gospel, but it's actually central to the gospel message, the central to all of the things that happen. And we could do a whole series showing how much the Holy Spirit is woven through this and why it's so a part of the main dish and not a side course of the gospel. But because Pentecost has fallen this year in the middle of this identity series, where we wanna focus this morning is what does that have to do with this 12 identity concept we've been talking about? What does that have to do with Christ in me and who I am? And so we're gonna zero in 
on this verse written by Paul in a letter to the church of Ephesus. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So I'm going to pass it off to David now, like to tell us what does that have to do with? What is Paul getting at with this seal um, and what that has to do with our identity? You know, a seal is kind of foreign to us. We probably have watched enough movies. We get an idea of kind of what that would look like as far as a seal. But the seal we're talking about, you, you know, you might if you have the imagery is basically if a king who has all this authority has something that he declares, there'd be like a scroll wrapped and there would be either clay or wax and they would, he'd take his ring, his one-of-a-kind ring, and say, this is, this is the way it is. It's solid. It becomes that truth as he does that. And, uh, and because of that, it was a very important thing. So people in that day would think like a king, they understand, oh my gosh, this is a seal. <laughs> this isn't just a, a concept we uh, ascend to. This is actually the truth, is that we actually have this truth of who, all the things that God says and what Jesus says, and that's the good news of that. And so, as we look at that, that we're marked with him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, is this, is this deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, right? And I think probably the, the best way I could think about, like, a seal is, I think, is probably, I don't know, it's hard in America, like a passport. That'd be what I think about, a passport. For any of you who travel, your passport is something that's really important to go to another country. And if you have your passport, you know how you, you guys do this thing where you, where's, by the way, I left my wallet. <laughs> I don't know, oh, it's at home. I, but I always go like this when I leave. My wallet here, my keys here, my phone, of course, that's important. But, but when you're overseas, it's like, where's my passport? Do you have my passport? If you think you lose your passport, you have to, but the, the thing about that is you can't even get in the, anywhere without the passport. So if you're going to the airport, and you have that feeling that you're wanting to come in and they're, gonna, they're looking at you and those people just kind of stare you down and you have this passport. There's this place in which you realize, I need them to stamp my passport. And that feeling you have of kind of, like, ah, it's, it's, it's official. I can now enter the country, right? And that feeling. That's a, that's a seal. But this is, you know, that's, and if you think about that, if you, if you have a passport that you know is right, you guard it. You know, sometimes you have a little thing you stick down and hold it underneath your clothes. You don't let me see it. You carry it with you. You always make sure. But when you see that passport, it reminds you, I'm okay. And then it gives you freedom to all the things and enjoy the things of that country. And it gives you the freedom to be able to move around the country and, and not worry about, you know, all the things you'd worry about without a passport. Because it's a seal. It's not just a thought. It's actually the truth. And it's, and it's legal, right? And so, the thing about the good news and Jesus saying is when, I, when, I, when you yield yourself to Jesus and receive his mercy, and what, Je, what Daniel just talked about, it's a seal. And it's a seal that is inward in our hearts. And it can't be expired. And no one can steal it away from us. And it's actually even better than that. It's better because it's really a true place of like citizenship or adoption papers. It's a place in which that what God says to be true is actually something that we can hold on to and know is true. And so as we think about that, you know, this is a place where when you have this, what happens internally when you know that? When you know that you actually have the seal of the Holy Spirit, it's this guarantee. It causes you to be able to not worry about your future. It allows you to know there's good ahead and you can live in the present in a whole new other way because you know there's this true inheritance you have and you can actually begin experiencing that presently even on this earth. So any thoughts you have on that, Danielle? I'm not going to get back up off the stool because it's too wobbly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm afraid the up and down is too precarious. Um, yeah, I think additional thoughts. When I think about 
the Holy Spirit being good news to me and connected to what we're talking about in the identities is not just the security it brings of to be able to go and do, but it's actually the empowerment to right. be that, that I would not be able to be any of these things that I'm being told I am without the Holy Spirit, and right. that it's just relieving to know that it's something that actually He helps make happen, and it's not something I'm doing all alone or striving to do on my own. Yeah, because maybe in the identity chart, you might look at those and think, oh, that sounds really good, but how would that actually take place? <laughs> how would that actually be the place I could actually know that I lived this? It's this place that it's, it, the Holy Spirit has to allow that to take place. You can't come up with that on your own. And so, so how it ties in, now we could talk, like you say, we could have the Holy Spirit, we have a whole series of this, but tying this into the place of what we've been talking about is that God has uniquely designed you and, but you, we, as in Christ, we have a, a brand new identity. And the chart we've used for that is these 12 identities, which were, ha we're kind of that transition point. We're moving from the primary standings into function and attitude. And, you know, the thing about that is it all happens because we look at Jesus being the center of that. But it, theologically, it could be this just as well. That's really what it is, the spirit of Jesus. The Holy Spirit within us is, allows this to take place. It is what establishes it. It's a chikunk. <laughs> you are secure. It is this who you are. But as, as Taylor talked about last week, it is who we have become and who are we are becoming. It's, it's who we are and what we're becoming and what we will become. And so there's this place of we knowing who we are, and then we're in this place of learning to walk out that in our everyday lives and how that looks. And so, you know, for me, a verse that we use quite often is, uh, that really helps me a lot in my life, is that just as you receive Jesus, so walk in him. You know, just however you receive Jesus, this place of I desperately need you, I can't do it on my own, and I receive his mercy, then you live that same way over and over and over. It's a lifestyle that you live. It's this place of having the Holy Spirit established in you, and then as the Holy Spirit's inviting you to something, you say, yes, and you get yes again. And in that spot, then you begin seeing identities that God has given you be able to start showing up in those places. So, the, um, what we want to do is, Danielle, I want to just talk a little bit about like, because we can say all we want, like, okay, this is a process, but we want to talk about how this process really works. Like, how does it really mean to the point that you, you have this, I am this in Christ, but how do I end up having, learning that to greater and greater degrees, uh, and how do we go about it? So I've, uh, we've kind of just prayed and thought about some different stories that kind of represent that. I'll let Danielle get started on it, and then I'll throw a few in. Yeah, as we were um, prepping and praying about uh, this Sunday, I kept thinking a lot about how um, Caleb taught last week that we that that we are the thing, but we are becoming the thing. How that happens is directly connected to yielding. This word of yielding, and so praying a lot about that, like yielding. And I was asking God, okay, give me some times where I've yielded to you, and it's revealed my identity, or it's helped me understand things. And all I could think about was this like long list of all the times I've not yielded to him. <laughs> and I was like, I'll decide, did I ever yield to you? I don't know, I couldn't think of a single one. Um, but eventually one did service of me not yielding. And so I'm just gonna trust that it's the one to, sh to share with today. Um, so when I was in my 20s, I had walked away from God. I'm very similar to, I think, what I understand deconstruction is for a lot of people right now, but where nothing felt real anymore and nothing clicked and nothing made sense. Um, and I wasn't sure that I believed in anything anymore, but also didn't know what I did believe in. And in that season, I was, <laughs> I was very wild. I was breaking all the like societal rules for what it is to be a nice person. Um, and in that, my grandparents, who were believers, were obviously really concerned about what they saw me doing, the choices I was making, um, and it was hard for them. And they were stayed, you know, they were Christians, they understood the Holy Spirit, and they had these good friends come into town who had what is called prophetic gifting, which means they had the ability to pray in a way where they were kind of hearing things from God for me that they couldn't have known without God's help. 
Um, so she, my grandmother's like, please let these, this couple pray for you. <laughs> and I was like, okay. But I really, truly only did it out of love for my grandparents because I saw how much it meant to them. But I had zero. I just had no interest anymore in participating in that. So I go to this night, um, and we meet somewhere where my grandparents are around because my grandma wanted to make sure she knew she had no influence on any of the that was happening. Um, and they start praying for me. And they started praying stuff that there's just, they couldn't have known it because even my grandma didn't know it. Like there was no way for them to be able to pray some of the things that they were saying about things that I, God had said to me in the past before I had kind of walked away from him. Things that were just kind of burdens on my heart, stuff I was struggling with, even naming some of the sins I was doing, but in a really loving way. And so in that moment, I yielded super good. I was crying. <laughs> I was letting myself feel the presence of God. Like I just allowed myself to be swallowed up by what was happening in that moment. When you can feel the Holy Spirit, it feels like a heaviness on your body, but a heaviness that's like comforting, almost like a weighted blanket. Um, and then also freedom to just bawl and sob the way I don't normally cry at all. And so I yielded. I did really good. But as soon as the time was over and I left, I stopped yielding. Everything they prayed about, everything they said, and in the way I lived my life stayed in that room. I did not yield anymore when I went out into the rest of my life. I went back to living everything exactly the same. And when I was praying, Jesus, why do you want me to share that? Like, why do you want me to, what does that have to do with identities? It doesn't seem helpful lesson at all to anyone. <laughs> and I was like, well, Why? And, you know, back then I didn't have this framework for understanding things. But when I can look back at what was going on with this framework in mind, with the Holy Spirit teaching me, like, what was happening, what I realized is in that season, I did not believe that I could be fully myself and fully God's at the same time. That in order to be fully God's, like, I was a totally different color palette than what's up here. And if I was gonna be fully his, I had to become a whole new color palette. Nothing could stay the same about who I was. And that did not sound appealing to me, and it also didn't feel possible to me. And so I was like, there is no way to yield, to be near God the way I was in that room and all the rest of my life, because I would have to not be me. And I, it just wasn't possible. Now, over time, I've learned that that's different, obviously. Um, through times that I did actually yield and then yielded past the moment. Um, and what I've ended up learning is looking back on this is how much it's like, no, what I didn't understand back then, what made it hard, actually, actually impossible for me to yield was that I didn't know that what Jesus wanted was me to be child as Danielle is a child to be a worshiper as Danielle is a worshiper, to be a light or a student or sheep, like all those things as me not as somebody different. Mm. And knowing that was like, oh, I can yield. I can yield safely. He's not out to destroy me. He made me on purpose. <laughs> it's like the way I am. And not understanding that back then is what made this impossible for me to say, okay, Holy Spirit, I'm going to take this moment here, and I'm actually going to try to do something outside of this moment with you. Oh, that's good. So that's yeah. I had a couple of things that came to my mind. I think the first time I, I was you know, thinking about this place of that seal, and some of you have heard my story so many times, I, like I, I always uh, jump back and forth, and you might hear me say, when I met God as a young child of eight, and the next time you hear me, like, when I fully gave myself to Christ at age 16, you think, well, which was it, Dave? Was it eight or was it 16? And I want to explain that, because I think it helps us understand this place, so especially in this place of identity, is as an eight-year-old, a person explained exactly what Danielle said about the gospel, and he talked about how he accepted the forgiveness of Jesus and how Jesus took away his sin and that he was secure in knowing that, that would never, I would never be separated from God. And when he said that, as an eight-year-old, I didn't have terms for this, but I knew the Holy Spirit was talking to me. And they said, if you want that, come forward. And I almost ran up weeping and saying, I want that, I want that. And uh, the pastor wanted me to join the church. I said, I don't care about that. I want Jesus. I mean, that's, <laughs> I just wanted to just do that. And at that moment, the seal took place. I had the Holy Spirit. And at an eight-year-old, I went out doing drugs or anything. And I just, but I was just like, I'm a pretty good kid, but now I have the Holy Spirit. And over time, I think what happened was at that point, I would say what I understood about my identity. I, I knew that God was a father 
a parent who loved me, and I knew he wouldn't abandon me. And I knew if he said that was true, he'd have to hold up on it. Like, sorry, I can't let go of you because I'm a good dad. You know, so I'm thinking, so I just had this security of like, I, I don't think anything's going to change this. I mean, I just knew that was true, and I had this hope and this security. But then over time, I, my, my understanding was is now till I get to heaven or this past this life, I got to be good. And it was not too hard to be good at eight. It got a lot harder as time went on. And by the time I was 16, I was in a really dark spot. I mean, really dark spot and um, not doing well at all. But then my brother came along and began, who wasn't a very nice person. I loved him, but he wasn't, I wasn't either. And, but he started becoming nice and he started, he came to Jesus. And so he told me about it. And I remember when he started talking to me, I started feeling that same thing I did at eight. And I've been feeling it for like a, quite a bit lately. <laughs> but now my brother was there, so I couldn't just avoid it. And he started talking to me about this feeling. And he said, you can just respond to this and everything will change. And I didn't believe it. I thought, no, you don't understand. I'm, I'm way down the road here. I can't, I've been trying to change for a long time. He goes, no, that's not what it's about. It's just, it's just responding. So he, he, he said, you go respond right now. So I thought, I don't know what, even what that means. And so I remember laying there and I just said, help or something like that. I need you, Jesus, or something like that. And then that was it. And, the, and what it just started changing, this place I started realizing that I have a reason for being here and I could start feeling God. And I thought, oh, maybe he could do that again and again. And so that's how that kind of started. And so I started thinking that beyond that, I started saying, just as I talked about that verse, is just as you receive Christ, he'll walk in. That's what it meant. Like, I realized that there's just endless, I mean, I started thinking about it, endless stories I could tell and endless opportunities because God is working all the time. And we can make that choice to yield or not to yield over and over again, different places, and he's so gracious. And so I thought of two things that, just an example to kind of put it into other places. You know, one part was, you know, when Debbie and I, I don't know if you know this, my wife Debbie and I, we actually fight sometimes. I don't know if you know that. And in conflicts, we have very quiet fights. you just like this. And so if I'm irritated at Debbie, I have not figured out a way of getting past that other than just disappearing for a while and coming back. And so because of that, I realize this is the one I have a really hard time yielding to. Because when I'm at that spot, I am thinking, this is what happened. Here's my point. This is always his way. I just, my mind is going like this. And I realize what I have to do is I have to listen to the Holy Spirit. And he's always talking. By the way, he's always talking to me at those times. I just don't want to hear him, Right. And so I remember thinking, and really what it gets down to, it's, it's I have this attitude of server. I have to say, God, I need, you, I need you to help me figure out what that means. And what's funny, it's not like I, I ever feel like I'm going to just start serving Debbie. I have to go to Jesus and say, I'm your servant. What do you want me to do? And he always gives me something I'm supposed to do, like apologize, or do something, or say this or say it more clearly or what things are but it's it's not up to me anymore it's because i'm yielding to what he says and it just has changed all kinds of things another one i thought about was way back when i first was at a bible our bible study and we'd be singing these songs and i remember feeling this invitation to open myself up to god but i was so self-conscious of what people thought about me and i remember that this sounds crazy now being in the vineyard but I remember I dared to close my eyes and not care what people thought and just close my eyes and I could feel God saying close your eyes I said no I don't want to close my eyes just close your eyes and when I closed my eyes I would feel God's presence and I started understanding oh this is what it means to be a worshiper you can open your whole self up to the Holy Spirit your spirit to his spirit so those are just a few examples and uh, any other thoughts? Okay, so what we want to do, right, because we can talk a lot about the Holy Spirit, we can talk about how the Holy Spirit has directly impacted us, but what we want is the Holy Spirit to interact directly with you so that the Holy Spirit's presence in you becomes more real than it was when you walked in the door, wherever you are at in your understanding of the Holy Spirit. 
So what we wanna do is we wanna just take a minute of silence and what we want you to be doing is to close your eyes or just look downward or like soften your gaze, whatever lets you kind of be more aware of what's happening to your insides and less aware of what's happening around you. And to just pay attention, what, what was going on as we spoke this morning, as we packed a lot of information, what, what parts stood out as we shared, what parts stood out to you? Um, and just take some time to notice that or notice what you're feeling. If nothing has stood out to you, what are you feeling inside? Keep your eyes closed. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. I just feel like Jesus wants me to say, and you keep your eyes closed, to be listening to to Jesus, if this resonates with you as I'm speaking. But as we move into our time of worship here shortly, I think one thing that is good for us to pay attention to is something that Kitty actually taught several months ago, and it's this question, is are you choosing your choices based out of, of being motivated by joy, or do you make most of your choices out of avoiding pain? And specifically, it's not even pain, because that seems big, it's like avoiding discomfort. And I feel like the Holy Spirit just wants to show us as we worship if those areas where we, why we're stuck in not yielding is actually connected to us being more motivated by that discomfort avoidance, that pain avoidance, than motivated by the joy that could be before us in yielding. Mm -hmm. And so, Jesus, I ask right now, you begin, Holy Spirit, showing those, surfacing. I believe you already are, mm -hmm. but bring those forward for people in a way that helps them see that there is actually joy in the thing you're inviting to be yielded to and not pain and not discomfort. Mm -hmm. The other thing I thought, too, is just your, the choices sometimes feel kind of small and you can discount them, but you, can, you know <laughs> down at your gut level this is something that seems like it's right here in front of me, and you may not even know how it's connected to things, but it's not about how big the item is or, or whatever. Sometimes it's, it's really just a matter of paying attention. So it's, it's, it's really more true that God is, people are more clear that God's talking to them than we say when you really give some give us time. It's just that, what do I do with that? And I think God just wants you to know he's tremendously gracious. And he's tremendously kind, and he's doing this. He's bringing this thing up in you because he cares about you and wants you to flourish. And so during the worship time, I would encourage you, there may be many times when we even talk about our examples, we, didn't, we kind of mentioned it, but often there's a flurry of our minds trying to discount or justify what's taken place. And that's always a sign God's speaking to the deeper part of us. And so a lot of that's even, we need God's help to even know how to hear that part and, and, and understand this is a good invitation.